Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back finally to the episode 2 for the uh, review and critique of uh, When Dinosaurs Roamed America uh, documentary program uh, by myself and uh, my co-host. Uh, so let's welcome my co-host once again, uh, John Michalski. John, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing quite well. Glad to be on again. Okay, well, uh, I was certainly looking forward for us to doing this uh, segment. Uh, it's been a while since we finally found our time off work and other commitments to finally sit down and get it uh, recorded. So um, let's, uh, I suppose, let's get into this and uh, just start from the first part. So I'm going to uh, change the image slide right now. And uh, we are on the setting of the New Work Super Group. And uh, would you be so kind to explain to us what's going on here? So basically, as we see, there is a screenshot of the actual documentary where it says that it tells us basically that it's 200 million years ago and it's Pennsylvania. And uh, you have composed this nice shot to basically give an overview of what's going on here. So uh, would you be so kind and give us... Uh, uh, explanation of what we're seeing here. Absolutely. So, this second segment in the documentary also takes place within the Newark supergroup, similar to the first one. But unlike the first one, in which it's a bit more obvious that it's in the Lakatong formation with Rudyudan and Icarosaurus, the second segment's uh, official formation is a bit more difficult to piece out because um, um, there's of the three dinosaurs, only one of of the three dinosaurs that are in the segment, only one of them is from the Newark supergroup, and it's not necessarily from Pennsylvania. So I narrowed it down to two possible formations, uh, one of which is the Feltville formation, which is the one that I've um, highlighted on the map um, in northern New Jersey with the green star. The Feltville formation is, is located. Um, Within, uh, within New Jersey um, and a bit of New York and a bit of Pennsylvania, so that's why I sort of think this might be the one they're going with. But because Pennsylvania is only one of the states that is encompassed within the formation, I don't really know how reliable that is. And then, especially because it's such a really obscure formation, um, the Feltville also does not have any dinosaurs known from it at all. There's no official fossil um, dinosaurs from there. Um, there's fish, but we don't see any fish, so it doesn't really matter. And then there's indeterminate um, Ornithischian tracks that have been known, so they're just ichnofossils. Um, no official species. Um, I went with the Portland Formation as a possible alternative as well. Uh, the Portland Formation is a part of Connecticut and Massachusetts, which is very much not part of the documentary itself, but it is the formation that includes um, the one dinosaur that is from the Newark supergroup in this segment. So um, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of early Jurassic uh, formations and animals that we'll get into a bit more detail as we go along. Uh, based on the Feltville formations, uh, uh, paleoecological um, status, it's pretty similar to the Lakatong in that there's it's just mostly a relatively tropical area with the series of lakes which is briefly touched which is briefly shown in the introductory shot to the segment but for the most part the segment takes place within dense forest uh, i don't think the ecology itself is inaccurate necessarily it still fits with what the newark supergroup was like at the time but um from here on out it's going to be a bit of a funky mess trying to explain um, some of the anachronisms that occur in this one, and also the fact that you know it's it's a very it's a very obscure formation um, within a very relatively um, spotty uh, supergroup for fossils. Um, and so, I guess overall, what I'm trying to say is that this is um, it's it's I, I currently I personally find it to be the weakest of the segments in terms of holding up with in terms of um, the animals that live in there and the formations itself. So that's what I've got for now on the setting. Uh, yes, and uh, I think uh, we want to perhaps um, 
let me just think what would be our best next slide to go into since uh, we would probably want to actually establish some uh, timelines so do we want to go into the anachronisms or anachronisms or shall we go through the animals individually first perhaps just assess them what we think of them and then do the overall kind of thing as we go bit by bit basically i was thinking of going um uh individually with the animals first just so that we can get um like we can discuss their physical appearance and behavior first and then once we've established that we can then go on to the um anachronisms and what they actually look like within the fossil record okay so we'll start with the first one that i just managed to grab and uh that is the uh, Ankisaurus uh, polyzelos, or polyzelos, or polyzelos, polyzelos. <laughs> you know, it depends how you pronounce it, of course. If you want to try to do the Latin based, of course, I probably butcher that. But um, in any case, um, this is one of the animals in the top left, which is how it's depicted in the show. On the right hand side, uh, do you happen to know who the artist is? Is that. Uh, Mm. Um, you know. mm. I don't remember off the top of my head. I made this a while back, and um, I don't remember who the artist is for the Ankysaurus on the right here. Okay, so anyway, uh, if anybody's who, anyone who's watching this video right now, uh, could you write down in the comments if you have if you are the artist or if you happen to know who the artist is for both that and the skeletal diagram? Could you? let yourself be known or let us know who the artist is and we will just add a side note update it maybe later in the description to make sure that we give the credit to the image um but uh, uh that aside i wanted to uh, say that i've made a note on the ankisaurus and the way i went about it is that while um it's the way the show basically depicts it it's it's very it's almost like this dinosaur seems to know kung fu and uh, is like a martial artist basically of how it defends itself from the relatively smaller predators and uh, i just felt like it was a little bit unrealistic and over the top even though generally speaking i am not uh, opposed to the idea of uh, using any tools that they could possibly use you know to be able to save their own lives that's perfectly normal but the way it was shown felt to me like it was a little bit unrealistic um and of course uh, i would say that perhaps uh there is an alternative uh you know uh, proposition for it's like more like as like as if like it's a utility tool could be a bit more plausible perhaps the way they would you know the way i would go about it and uh, and I think, uh, well, in my view, if I really wanted, if I were to do this myself and wanted to show some self-defense there, I would probably just try to see if, the, if, if I could depict it as using its own body weight against a smaller carnivore attacker rather than just trying to come up with these crazy kung fu tricks. Because the body weight alone can actually do quite a lot of damage, which is very frequently underrated and underestimated by many people uh, who, you know, uh, in the community. So, uh, the other thing that you have correctly pointed out uh, to me before we started recording, John, is that while the animal is depicted as a quadruped, mainly, even though in this screenshot it's shown as it's bipedal, but mainly it's depicted in the show as, I think, a quadruped. But it's pretty apparent now that we know that basal sauropodomorphs were mainly bipedal. So would you be able to verify this? Right, so basal sauropodomorphs or prosauropods, depending on which one you prefer, um, they have hands that, much like theropods, or I should say most theropods, because I know Deinonychus can pronate its hands, but most other, ther but like most other theropods, uh, prosauropods, uh, cannot pronate their hands, so they cannot maneuver them in, maneuver them in such a way that they can properly walk on all on all fours. So um, the pose that I have the Ankysaurus in um, from the documentary shows it as bipedal, um, and it does, which is still fairly correct. 
but when it's running away from the quote unquote syntarsis uh, pack, um, it's definitely in all fours. And in real life, uh, Ankysaurus and other basal sauropodomorphs um, cannot run on all fours. Uh, maybe more advanced forms down the line probably could. But for things like Ankysaurus, there's no, they cannot uh, move their hands in such a way they can um, move on all fours. Okay, well, in this case, uh, understood, I guess. And uh, shall we move on to the quote unquote Centarsis since you mentioned it? Uh, before we do that, I wanted yeah. to point out something about the Ankysaurus size. Um, the reason why I have a bunch of size diagrams here is because. Um, so for the longest time, Ankysaurus, and to an extent still now, Ankysaurus is largely seen as a fairly small um, sauropodomorph. Now, you look at the animal that is in the documentary, and obviously it's not, the big, it's not necessarily the biggest herbivore, or not the biggest dinosaur in the documentary. It's still pretty big, um, about closer to the size of Massospondylus, which is why I have the diagram of the Massospondylus uh, in the bottom right. Now, um, to my knowledge, uh, part of the reason why this was done is because they were basing the size measurements off of another basal sauropodomorph called Amosaurus. And Amosaurus is, uh, is, as far as I can tell, now considered a synonym of Ankysaurus. So the size, to my knowledge, is, I think, a bit more explainable now. Um, but uh, I did not. I was not able to find a proper um, skeletal or size diagram for Ankysaur for Amosaurus to compare with the Ankysaurus in the documentary, um, and so because of that, uh, I'm sucking with Massospondylus because it fits pretty well with um, in comparison to the other dinosaurs within the documentary. But I wanted to make that a point because I know one of the common criticisms of Ankysaurus in the show is that it's too big. And they're not wrong, but nowadays it, it kind of makes a little bit more sense with how it's a synonym of Amosaurus. Um, also, real quick, I while you were talking, Arsene, I looked up the uh, artist, and it's uh, Elena Duverne uh, who made the uh, 3D, uh, 3D depiction of Ankysaurus on the right. So, But I want to just get that off the table, because I know that's a big criticism throughout the Ankysaurus, is its size. Okay, uh, sounds good, and yes, thanks for looking up the artist while you were able to do so, and uh, uh, credit to, uh, may I ask you to say, was it Elena Duvernay, or you said? Yep, Elena Duvernay, Digital Art, or Elena Arts, uh, right. so. Okay, well, and uh, I suppose, well done for a nice piece, I suppose, good work. <laughs> so, uh, glad it came it's in handy. It's what we know. If you're watching, I hope well, I'm glad it came handy, and I hope you don't mind, uh, since we obviously just found out that it was your art. So post your comment below and let us know what you think. Anyway, um, are we ready to move to the quote-unquote Syntarsis? Yes, let's move on to the quote-unquote Syntarsis. Okay, so I'm going to quickly grab the uh, slide of this fellow. And uh, there's quite a lot going on with this uh, thing. So uh, it's uh, how do where do we start really? I mean, uh, for one, um, they are not. For for once, it's actually unclear what the hell they are. Truly speaking, to with you, as far as I can understand, it's just really unclear because uh, of the taxonomy with it. It's confusing, so it's it was then potentially maybe it was a Megapnosaurus. Then uh, the obviously American remains actually of this dinosaur. If they are in fact synonymous with Megapnosaurus, they are unclear whether you know they are not very well diagnosed as far as I'm aware of at least. So it's 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 basically the whole thing is just super unclear. But the Megapnosaurus, which is more likely to have been this animal, is from Africa. It's not from United States. And uh, while, and the funny thing is about it as well is that while the Ankysaurus does fall within the date, the time period of 200 to 195 at least, 
and uh, it's based in Massachusetts, which is another interesting thing, but this one, which we will get to later, but uh, this one is dated a bit further ahead, 199, which kind of goes outside of that by one million years, and one million years is still a lot of years, <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, you, you are basically, they're basically quite a bit off on that mark. So, now interesting thing I wanted to point out is they've depicted it as almost having like this Dilophosaurus-like crests, if I'm correct, right? They give it a bit of a... I think it's a single crest. It's, um, single it's not crest. as big as Dilophosaurus, but I think that is based off of the holotype for... Um, I'm just gonna call it a Kayenta theropod because I don't entirely trust any too much of its uh, taxo taxonomic status. So the Kayenta theropod does have some sort of growth on its head, to my knowledge, based on the holotype, but it's not very complete. It's not very well preserved, to my knowledge. So it's a bit speculative as to how um, it it exactly looked um, in the compared to what it looked like in the documentary. Um, and compared to the art piece from uh, Sergei Krasovsky that I have in the bottom right there. Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment a little bit on that as well. For example, the documentary, if you look very closely, makes them look a little too derpy. Uh, like their eyes are bulging out too much, you know, there's just uh, something weird going on with their smiley kind of faces. I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> so it's just kind of comical, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that's because of the shot that was taken here or what, but it's uh, it's I can I can see the derpiness in the uh, facial appearance of the creature itself. I would say the Krasovsky's uh, Sergei's um, depiction, on the other hand, uh, despite the fact that it's probably dated, regardless, but it looks quite spot on. I think more or less, give or take, again. Of course, I cannot see all the way because it's a small image, but uh, if it doesn't have the visible finesse, which I think this uh, depiction, I cannot see either, but I don't think they actually make the finestra visible. Even the documentary, I don't believe, does that in this particular case. Which, if they don't, it's a massive plus, you know, it means they were so ahead of the game in that time when, it, when they made this show, in that sense. But if, of course, they made it and it's just because of the lighting we cannot really see it, then I suppose I take that back. But I hope that it's, uh, it was still valid, what I said, because that would make a very nice plus to this particular part. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not seeing any visible fenestry. That would imply shrink wrapping, so it's... Uh, it, it, it's I think, I think they uh, got that, uh, nailed it on the head, I think. Is there anything else you wanted to add about this dinosaur? Um, other than the fact that whatever creature this is based on is very much uh, kind of a giant nightmare in terms of taxonomy, not really. I, I think it's, I mean, the build-wise, it's fine. Um, if I had to be really nitpicky, I think, and this is what's going to apply to our next dinosaur too, they kind of announced their presence early on when they're hunting the Ankysaurus, which is a little bit weird, but, um, and ends up getting one of them killed as a result, so, um, odd, but whatever. Um, also like the fact that a bunch of these, um, string bean theropods are gonna go up against a fairly big, uh, prosauropod head-on. I, I don't, I, I find it, I find it amusing. Um, not that it hurts my investment in the documentary, but I find it, uh, comical um just yeah that's uh that's most of what i have to say on that so i'm pretty much on the same page as you are on this uh, but if you're happy we can take our next dinosaur sounds good okay so in this case uh well uh we have more, significantly more to comment on on this dinosaur and as you might have guessed, yes, that's probably going to be the star of this episode. Uh, the dinosaur Dilophosaurus itself. What do you know? Now, uh, Dilophosaurus, uh, first of all, I wanted to comment on its hunting. Uh, and uh, 
it's really once you again it's the same beaten up trope of basically making carnivores for some reason announce their presence to the world instead of trying to subtly as much as possible like get as close as possible you know to their prey and try to land like a free bite if you will to start bleeding it or weakening it somehow or doing something with it you know actually basically being useful when it comes to the hunting process versus just doing it for the sake of looking cool which is just not um, how animals do it <laughs> you know it's uh, like it's not exactly your house cat that sometimes plays really funny pranks and you happen to be able to catch it on a video you know that's not the same thing this is a reptile they obviously don't have the same kind of brain uh, level power as uh, m mammals to be more sophisticated but also they don't exactly go around announcing themselves to everyone when they need to kill something so you know i'm not saying that they would not be able to make some kind of vocalizations uh, the case i'm making is that announcing it so loudly like they do just isn't going to help them to actually succeed i mean they do succeed nevertheless but uh, it's just kind of, uh, once again, a bit amusing and com comical to me of how they decided to portray that part. Now, that's basically that specific point. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, behavior-wise, once one more point is the fact how they show them uh, two individuals fighting. I liked that part. Actually, that was a major plus for me in this particular thing, this episode, is how they show how they're trying to aim for their necks or heads which is quite a common target actually for many animals when they start engaging in the combat and reptiles do that as well they like biting each other's faces quite a lot in fact so yeah i'm perfectly fine with that so props to them for doing this and uh, at the same time i also like how they are maintaining the posture you know when they're trying to intimidate their opponents it's a very interesting part as well that i don't think we get to see very often being shown when it comes to dinosaurs so that was very good now i wanted to get into the appearance briefly as well and then you can add your own things as well after i cover mine because i'm pretty much almost done here with that part so um i like that generally the uh, depiction I mean, I could say that it's a bit more grounded and conservative depiction, but of course there are some things you can probably guess that I think are still overly embellishing it. And specifically it's the osteoderm-like structures, like these scoots that you can see pretty well, quite prominently on their bodies. We have no evidence for them, and I think it was just simply not the right decision to do it. I didn't see the reason why they needed to do it. It would have looked just fine without them, personally, my opinion. So I just didn't see why they needed to do it, if even if they wanted to think, okay, so, like we can make it look like this because it's gonna make them look super cool. But I did not see that as you know a good reason in this case. If that were the case, indeed, it just wasn't necessary in my opinion. They would have still looked just as cool. And because of you see, as I said, my main objective on this uh, objection, I mean is that it doesn't have any evidence to support the osteoderms or scoots like that. So I don't think it's a very good choice, because this would have been a very strong defining characteristic of the animal, which would require evidence to support its presence, in my opinion. Like, it's not something minor or like some other things that you can somehow debate, potentially, where it's open to interpretation. This is more of something like when you have osteoderms of some kind, you have to actually show there is presence. Like Ceratosaurus has them, for example, and thus depicting them with osteoderms uh, is perfectly reasonable, in my opinion. So, the other thing I, I like about this depiction, though, is that unlike some modern trends in the quote-unquote paleo art in these days, where they show them having chesty beards and fluffy testicles on the throat areas, I think this one is actually pretty, well, on point, I would say, to a degree. That's not saying that it's perfect. I can't, I can't say that I'm like a major fan of it, but it's not bad. And, of course, uh, my problem, another problem I have is the fenestry. Once again, the visible fenestry is a major issue for me in this case. And, um, and now I wanted to 
give you the microphone and also comment on the image that you've used in the middle if you happen to know who the author of the image is and uh, whatever else you have to add on Dilophosaurus. Sure. Well, first of all, the image in the middle is by someone named Soren B. I unfortunately do not know their official name, but um, Soren B is the artist behind this Dilophosaurus. Um, on, I thought I was going to say Art Station, but I could be mistaken on that. Um, but the arts, I decided to go with this one because it it's personally my favorite uh, depiction of Dilophosaurus outside of the documentary itself. Now, I... Um, I'm of the, I personally am a major fan of Dilophosaurus in the documentary. That's not to say it's perfect, um, and I do think they do embellish quite a bit, um, especially with its roar. They really are proud of how they made that thing, but it does sort of um, hurt its depiction when it's announcing its presence and um, very much making it abundantly clear to the Ankysaurus that um, it's around and it's going to kill it. But... I personally find it um, my personal favorite depiction of Dilophosaurus in any media, and that can change obviously as time goes on. But um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, obviously the design is great. Um, aside from the rather shrink wrapped head and the osteoderms, uh, it gives the impression of Dilophosaurus is not this spindly, scavenging type creature that. Um, was thrown around as, as a hypothesis for its behavior way back in the day. This is an animal that was definitely built to hunt and kill other dinosaurs. And obviously, I'm aware of the fact that isotope readings on its teeth indicate that it had a good chunk of its diet was based around fish. But I'm also of the opinion that Dilophosaurus was a generalist theropod uh, that you know could have eaten sauropodomorphs, smaller theropods, um, anything that it could get its claws and teeth on, and obviously had a strong preference for fish. So, um, with that being said, I think this documentary really does Dilophosaurus a lot of justice. The crest is, I don't want to say perfect, because we don't really have a proper, um, fully, re fully uh, recovered uh, crest of a Dilophosaurus. But the one that we see in the documentary is vastly better than what a lot of current trends show it to be. It's not this weird lettuce crest that, you know, it, it only exists because of a misinterpretation of the 2020 paper. And I know, our scene that you and some other of the guys uh, talked about uh, the 2020 Delophosaurus paper, which I personally recommend. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. They go in much more detail about... Uh, the 2020 Dilophosaurus paper, and I'm not gonna, I'm not here to steal their thunder by any means. But in summary, uh, it's it's just much more in line with what we know of Dilophosaurus rather than what trends seem to show it as. Um, and ultimately, I think it's it's a really solid depiction um, in terms of making it out to be a uh, just not 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 a spindly scavenging type and not some kind of weakling that had really weak jaws. Um, that, that was the hypothesis that was thrown around way back when, um, I just really like it. I really enjoy it. I think it's probably one of the best dinosaurs in the documentary, um, just in terms of depiction anyways, uh, if not necessarily in appearance, um, or behavior. Um, the one thing I will also point out too is that Dilophosaurus and quote unquote Syntarsis are labeled as Ceratosaurus. Now, this was something that way back when, I mean, when I was a kid, these things were considered ceratosaurs. So it's a fairly recent um, change from what it is today. But Syntarsis or Megapnosaurus, um, whichever one you want to go with, uh, I'll just go with Megapnosaurus for now. Megapnosaurus is um, part of Coelophysoidea, um, which originally used to be part of Ceratosauria, but it's now just its own group of very early basal theropods. And Dilophosaurus used to be have its own used to have its own little group called Dilophosauridae that has sort of now been uh, split up and Dilophosaurus now sort of stands as its only member as just a basal member of Neotheropoda. Uh, so where Dilophosaurus really stands in the family tree of theropods is kind of up in the air. But it's not a ceratosaur, and neither is Megapnosaurus. 
And it's an old idea that maybe back then might have made sense, but if it were released today, uh, it would not have made it makes very no it makes no sense nowadays. So um, uh, those are my two personal thoughts on di this Dilophosaurus. I honestly really like it, uh, flaws and all. So uh, yes, and uh, the other thing I wanted to add as well is uh, that. Uh, it's just to further uh, bring the attention to the to how it's classified recently. It used to form a group, I believe, with uh, Cynosaurus and Draco Venator, yeah, from from Asia and Africa, respectively. But uh, they are all basically just basal members of Neotherapoda now, as you correctly pointed out. So, as yeah. far as I'm aware of, I don't believe they belong to any other groups of any kind. Uh, which is very interesting, but again, you can watch the video uh, about it, uh, which you have mentioned, John, uh, earlier, which goes, we go into more detail. Since the paper itself actually focuses more on the phylogenetic aspect and uh, classification more than it does actually in its reconstruction, which is the very interesting part about it, that I don't believe the paper itself actually goes too in-depth about anything regarding its reconstruction physically. It's just that the, there's a drawing there that was used as a supplement, and then people, for some reason, decided that that's basically the paper's view on the dinosaur now. And even though the paper itself, I don't believe, actually makes the case for it. But, of course, if you want more details, since I, it's been a while since I've looked at the paper, and since, since I've made the video, you might want to check it out just to get a better, fresh, you know, sort of memory uh, about it. Regardless, however, is there anything else you have to comment on the Elophosaurus, or we can go to the next one? Uh, I think I've covered it. I didn't want to fanboy too much about it, um, but I think uh, I've covered it pretty much all I can say about it. I guess I also like the spur on back. For some reason, that's just missing in current re quote-unquote reconstructions, so i um, glad they put that in there, but yeah, other than that... Um, I'm ready to go on to the next thing. All right, so uh, let's uh, shift the slide into your Brontes, and uh, I believe you wanted to explain something about this one, so I'll just give the mic right over to you. Sure. So, um, much like in the other segments, when Dinosaurs from America has these fossil segments that really try and uh, tie into the focus of an episode or, or, or segment, and uh, one of the big motifs, running motifs with, throughout the early Jurassic segment is the fact that dinosaurs are getting bigger, um, bigger and better, as the show uh, says it verbatim. And uh, to tie into that, they have, I believe, Paul Olson again from the first segment uh, come in and talk about these prints, these footprints that show... Um, so on the, on the, in the middle section here, the, the top one is of a smaller theropod that's a bit probably closer in size to something you would see in the Triassic. And then the bottom one uh, is of a much larger, more uh, early Jurassic-based theropod. We don't exactly know what they officially belong to, um, but both of these would be classified as Eubrontes, which is a ichnofossil um, that has been found throughout North America and possibly elsewhere in the world. Um, and on the sides here, I have two different uh, examples of Eubrontes, uh, both from either sides of uh, North America. And the general idea being shown here is that dinosaurs were getting bigger, the theropods were getting bigger, and we also see a transition from a variety of footprints that would have included things like in, in his words, Desmatosuchus or other Pseudosuchians or maybe possibly Dicynodonts or any Triassic animals. And we really just see a wide range of dinosaur tracks, um, large and small uh, variants of possibly th of theropods and possibly some others uh, like sauropodomorphs or even basal ornithischians. Um, now... To my, I believe that this track site, even though they don't specify it, is based on uh, the prints at the Dinosaur State Park and Arbor uh, Arboretum, which is um, a track site that is found in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. 
Um, Ubrontes is, I believe, the state fossil of Connecticut, and it is one of the most prolific, prolific sites of Ubrontes specimens um, in the area and one of the most famous within the world. Um, on the right-hand side is a track from the Red Fleet Reservoir in uh, northeastern Utah of Ubrontes tracks. Now, um, the tracks at Red Fleet um, are, are currently assigned to Dilophosaurus, even though there is no official um, specimens of Dilophosaurus from Utah, and so it's difficult to say what kind of dinosaur they really were, not to mention the signs that say they were, they were from Dilophosaurus are pretty old, so I'm not really sure how reliable they are anymore, but um, the reason why I really was looking forward to talking about these things is that actually not too long ago I was able to go uh, check these things out, um, at Red Fleet, um, they are really cool and um, definitely give you a sense of how big these things were uh, getting by the early Jurassic. Uh, dinosaurs were really shrugging off their really small beginnings and definitely taking over these really prominent ecological niches of being um, m much larger predators, much larger herbivores, and it's shown throughout the uh, episode. It's Again, it's the general motif of the segment. Um, and Ubrontes really um, encapsulates that within the fossil record to see the transition from really small theropods uh, to really big ones. Um, and again, obviously, other dinosaurs as well. Um, which, funnily enough, we were talking about this earlier um, before we started recording that um, one of the things we thought about was the line that's towards the end of the segment about how uh, as the predators get bigger, so do the prey. And it does ask an interesting question as to which... It's sort of a chicken, chicken or the egg question where do the herbivores get bigger and the carnivores um, increase in size to hunt them or do the carnivores get bigger and the herbivores, um, do they end up becoming bigger in order to uh, better defend themselves from, car from these increasingly, more, increasingly larger and more dangerous theropods? Um, and it's, you know, I don't think there's ever, I don't think there's a way to properly explain that because I think it also, you also have to incorporate other factors in like what were the, what's the plant life doing that could also encourage them to get bigger. Uh, what was the hab what were the habitats like? What was the climate like? Um, there's a lot of factors that play into animals getting big. And while I under, and while I think a major part of that is the arms race between predators getting bigger and herbivores getting bigger um it's not always that simple and so it may only be one factor um in a sea of many similar to the triassic extinction we talked about uh last time so but i really wanted to talk about Ubrontes because it's definitely one of those specimens that um fascinates me just finding really good quality uh footprints of dinosaurs and uh, what 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 ichnofossils and trace fossils can tell us about life on earth so i'm really glad that this documentary brought um uh brought this to attention and i'm glad i even saw some myself to really see the real thing so i think this is probably the strong sides of this episode in particular even though uh, in your opinion it appears you say that it's one of the weakest episodes overall and i cannot say i disagree entirely but uh this particular part, however, seems to be quite strong. Uh, so I kind of uh, think that it's good uh, when they show more of these type of, you know, references. Things that don't frequently get brought up, you know? Which I think is a good idea to do. Yeah. So, uh, let's... Uh, are we happy to move on to the next slide? Sure, let's move on to the next slide. And uh, this one here is going to be our uh, final slide. This is setting the anachronosis or anachronistics, whatever. I, uh, I'm anachronisms. My God, yes. Why? Why are words difficult for me tonight? Maybe it's just because <laughs> I was after work. I guess I don't know. But uh, anyways, you get the points. The, here's the slide. So let's so uh, let's walk through this. So what's your um, what's your takeaway from this one? So um, this is this is the biggest reason why I consider the second segment of when dinosaurs roamed America the weakest because of the kinds of anachronisms that occur in it and the justifications necessary 
well, the reasons that would be necessary to justify having some of these dinosaurs here and there. So um, I will start with the one that's most accurate, um, Ankyosaurus pilosius. Um, it is only known from the Portland Formation of Connecticut and Massachusetts, and it's currently set to have lived between 200 and 195 million years ago, from the early Hittanginian to the middle of Cinemurian uh, stages of the, of the Jurassic. Um, now, for this segment, this would be ideal because Ankyosaurus lives within close proximity to, the, to Pennsylvania, which is where the setting is in the documentary. And it lived um, pretty much at the same time as the documentary puts it in. So it's pretty good, I would say, in terms of um, where it's placed, even though more realistically it would probably be in Connecticut or Massachusetts, at least from what we know of it. Um, and again, the Feltville formation has no official fossils of, like physical fossils of dinosaurs from it. So um, it's very much a kind of like, likely but not fully proved um sort of situation now dilophosaurus and quote-unquote syntarsis on the other hand they are not known from the east coast of north america so unless you're of the opinion that the eubrontes tracks of the east coast belong to dilophosaurus um we have no evidence to support that they come from uh, the east coast and uh, because of and so where so Dilophosaurus and the Cayenta theropod are only known from the Cayenta formation of Arizona, and maybe like places like the Navajo sandstone, which we do have quite a bit of it in Utah. Um, the Cayenta formation is um, uh, dated to be between 188 to 185 million years ago, whereas Dilophosaurus itself has also been dated to be about from about 193 to 185 million years ago. So when I was compiling data for this slide, I sort of lumped together the current date or one of the dates for the Cayenta information on the Wikipedia page and what's shown for Dilophosaurus on the Wikipedia page and sort of combined them together so that it gives the sense of maybe it did have a really long stretch of time or maybe it didn't, but um, it's kind of tricky because the Cayenta formation itself is, it's gone back and forth over the years as to what it's what it um what its radiometric dating is um where exactly fits in within the early jurassic um it used to be 200 million years ago within the hittanginian then it moved to the cinemurian now it's been being pushed later on into the plea uh pleans bachian not sure if i said that right but um and the reason why I bring this one up is because now we are much further away from the time that the episode takes place in. And these are animals that come from an entirely different part of the country. And going back to my uh, statement in the first segment about um, how localized dinosaurs tend to be, unless we're able to successfully find some fossils in the Newark supergroup that conclude that animals um, like a species of Dilophosaurus or even Dilophosaurus Wetherilli itself um, are from the East Coast, it would be basically these animals were traveling an enormous distance to reach one side of the continent from where they were originally, and we just don't have that kind of evidence. So it's essentially putting in two dinosaurs that are a bit more well-known in a location where they don't really belong. Um, as a result, it takes away from possible alternatives within, like, if they were to have set the setting in Arizona um, rather than uh, the rather than Pennsylvania, where they could have also had Scutellosaurus um, and uh, Cerosaurus, or maybe at the time Massospondylus, I don't know. Um, Cerosaurus, Scutellosaurus, um, and maybe a couple other dinosaurs in there too, uh, rather than having two different dinosaurs from a very very westerly uh, state be living in an easterly state um, that there is no evidence for them being in. So um, it's so basically, Ankyosaurus is all right, Dilophosaurus and Syntarsis much later, and not the other half of the continent, essentially. Yeah, so that's basically where they are making the biggest mistakes. And uh, it's a bit of a shame because you're absolutely spot on with the idea that um, they could absolutely go 
completely crazy in a good way and knock this thing com you know out uh, right there and then just by basically uh, exploring more uh, Arizona due to the fact that it's just much better known for its fossil record you know and what it contains in that particular time period and uh, aside right. from the dinosaurs also they could have even added some crocodilomorphs or whatever else like some Sudasukians that were around in that time as well which they were and uh, that could have also potentially generated some possible ideas of depictions that they could have used you know in order to uh, add a bit more depth to the story depending of course of what they would have chosen to depict but I just think it would have been a bit better in that sense so I guess uh, well there it is anything else you wanted to add about this since this is our final slide and we pretty much don't have any more uh, um, things to cover we've run our program on this episode so is there anything you wanted to add uh not really like i said it's in my opinion the weakest of the segments it has some really strong points like you brontes and i personally am a huge fan of their dilophosaurus but it's definitely the one that uh misses the mark in more places than the rest so i'm looking forward to covering the rest of the segments um in the future but for now that's all i've got for uh the early jurassic segment of when dinosaurs roamed america yes uh, likewise and the uh, next episode in fact is going to be very interesting because we're getting into the one of the meatiest and juiciest ones as far as i'm concerned like i would say probably the next episode and the one uh, that is going to be the last one so basically episode three and episode five if i'm correct right because it's totally five episodes if i'm re if i remember right there's um, five settings so yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, five settings. So yeah, the number three and number five are actually my favorite through this uh, of this show. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing the third one specifically in this case. So And I think you guys should too, which means we hopefully will be able to produce them uh, sooner than we produce this one. <laughs> At least that's going to depend on a variety of things like work and other commitments since as I keep saying just in case so that people don't forget it in case they do or if they don't know if they're new to the channel so they know youtube is not my job i just do it whenever i have time you know and uh, you know energy i guess as well to to deal with it and whatever shenanigans it's got but um uh thank you very much for watching or listening uh, and uh, we shall see you in our next uh, segment uh, of when dinosaurs roamed america it was been ak rex and john Machalski, and uh, until then guys you take care and thanks for coming and watching sounds good